Thank you. And yeah, I'm really excited to be here. I'm short, but the I've been told that Olivia will adjust for my height requirement. <laughs> um, but no, my name is Stacy Smith. Um, I'm a licensed professional counselor here in the state of Ohio, um, which basically just means that I get to help people through various things like mental health disorders, COVID, and it's been a very interesting couple of years for it. Um, you know, I think as a counselor reflecting on the last few years, um, we were really just kind of like thrust into this pandemic along with everyone else. But our, our role was kind of to help people process their grief through it. And, you know, I don't know any other therapists who have done that during a pandemic. So all of us were just kind of learning as we went. And it was a really, really interesting time. Um, we saw a really big drop off of people seeking out mental health services at first. And we thought we worried that that was gonna continue. And then all of a sudden it just skyrocketed. Um, the company that I work for, Restoring Hope Counseling and Coaching, we, we had, I think, 15 to 20 therapists on staff at the start of the pandemic. And now we have almost 40. Wow. Yeah, so multiple states, multiple cities, people doing telehealth, people in the office. And it was really just to meet that demand. So that's kind of part of how this conversation for today came up because we acknowledge that mental health is tricky. Um, sometimes even just knowing where to go or what questions to ask or when to go seek out therapy or other services can be one of the biggest barriers that prevents people from doing it. So having these kinds of conversations the hope is that some of those barriers will be eliminated and it will be an easier time. So um, I mentioned earlier that I work part-time for Restoring Hope Counseling and Coaching. I also work with elementary age students through Talbert House. That is my full-time job. So helping them through the pandemic has been interesting as well. So without further ado, oh, that is so cool. All right. So first thing that we're going to be talking about today is just kind of the what on earth is therapy, mental health counseling, because sometimes just knowing the different terms and things like that can be really overwhelming. And as I said earlier, that in and of itself can sometimes be a barrier for people, or they might not know what kind of counseling they need, who they need to see. Do they need a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a, a social worker? What do all of these terms mean? How do they overlap? How are they different? So the plan today is to kind of help alleviate and answer some of those questions. Um, starting with what on earth do counselors like myself and licensed social workers do? Our primary role is to diagnose and treat mental health disorders. Um, we oftentimes will see a lot of depression, anxiety disorders, PTSD is a very big one. Um, but we also work with individuals who might have a bipolar disorder or a personality disorder. There are tons of um, things that can be worked with. We operate using the DSM-5, which is kind of like our guidebook for disorders. But our role mainly is we diagnose and treat these by the use of training coping skills and in a sense, teaching people how to rewire their brain um, through talk, art, various forms of processing, even some really cool things like EMDR, which uses eye movement to kind of get into your subconscious and process some things that have been locked away. Um, but yeah, that's primarily what we do. So counselors like myself and licensed social workers, we diagnose and treat mental health disorders. We provide support, encouragement, um, even sometimes a little bit of coaching, though there are life coaches who do a lot more of that than we do. Psychologists, I get asked if I'm a psychologist all the time and the answer is no. Um, psychologists are usually doctorate level. Well, they are doctorate level. And they can also diagnose and treat mental health disorders. But what really sets them apart is they are also able to administer and interpret a multitude of different um, assessments and tests that we may not be able to. So as a counselor, I can administer some pretty basic assessments to support 
a diagnosis or to help an individual just kind of track their progress through their treatment. But a psychologist can really get into the nitty gritty and administer some of those like really, really big um, exams and assessments. I don't know if anyone is keeping up with the like Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial, but they had a psychologist on and she was talking about the results of a almost 600 question assessment. And I'm like, yeah, that's a psychologist. <laughs> that is not something that I would be qualified to do. So if you are dealing with something that is more severe or something that you feel needs to have more testing, like maybe, you know, maybe autism spectrum disorder or some of the more severe personality disorders, a psychologist would be really good for you in that regard. School psychologists. This is where individuals with children can sometimes get into confusing waters. Um, a lot of people think that school psychologists are the same thing as a mental health psychologist or even a counselor like myself. And that's not the case. A school psychologist, their function is typically to administer educational tests and assessments to determine if a student needs like an IEP, a 504, or other special education needs. Um, they don't provide mental health services, though they are usually a good resource in connecting you with that. Um, but working in an elementary school, I see that confusion all the time. Um, we have a parent who I've never talked to, but for the last few months, I have been, quote unquote, responsible for writing their child's IEP, um, which I'm not. So we're trying to get them to understand that. But I, I completely understand where they would get, uh, where they would kind of get confused on that. And then psychiatrists, they prescribe medication. Rarely do they also provide the diagnosing and treating per se, like through the use of coping skills. So I always recommend that if an individual is just kind of starting out and they begin to work with a psychiatrist, they should probably also be working with a counselor because the psychiatry, you know, the medication can be really helpful in balancing some of those things in the brain that are just going haywire. But if you don't follow that up with coping skills and kind of rewiring your brain yourself, um, you know, you're, you're going to become dependent on the medication. And then if that ever stops working for you, then you're back at square one. If you're working with a psychiatrist and a counselor, however, they can be working together to get you further and further and further along. Another word of caution that I like to give people is some general practitioners, like your family doctor, will sometimes prescribe medications like a psychiatrist would. And there are some who do that well, and there are others who don't. Um, so I always try to encourage, if you're just starting out, see an actual psychiatrist. Don't just go to your primary care physician. Um, I had one who had before I saw them had diagnosed a client of mine with bipolar disorder and had them taking medication to treat it. And we did some assessments on them and we determined, no, this individual is not bipolar. They're dealing with obsessive compulsive disorder. And the doctor said, no, they're not. They don't wash their hands 10 times a day. Mm -hmm. And that was the criteria he used to determine that they were not OCD. So I always caution people when they want to start with their PCP. Um, I recommend asking their general practitioner for, for, for a referral to a psychiatrist. Um, also, during this presentation, at any point, if anyone has questions or thoughts, I am interruptible. So <laughs> please just jump right in. Focusing in again on the what, um, different types of counseling. There is peer counseling. Um, peer counselors are not licensed individuals. So sometimes a pastor might be considered a peer counselor if they don't hold that clinical license to diagnose or treat. And there are some um, programs or agencies, which we'll talk about later, that offer peer counseling. They train people to be peer counselors and they have actual clientele that they serve with their peer counselors, which is awesome. They are great for support, encouragement. Um, sometimes I will refer people to a peer counselor for things like grief, where really they just want someone to come alongside and listen to them, offer them kind words, and just kind of walk alongside them through a difficult stage in life. 
Um, and student ministry here at the church that does just that. There you go. Student ministry here at this church that does that. And I love to see it. We need, we need more of that. Clinical counseling is different. Like I said, licensed individuals like myself, we are actually trying to diagnose and treat these mental health disorders. So some of the letters that you'll often see that let you know that you're in, heading in the right direction would be LPCs or LPCCs like myself, the extra C just stands for clinical um, LSWs, licensed social workers, or MFTs, marriage and family therapists. These are all individuals who are qualified to do the diagnosing and the treating. And then crisis support. Um, there are resources available for anything that is life-threatening or severely life-altering, where you need help right away. You know, you need support either immediately or in, the, or in the next couple of days or so. There are resources for that available. And they are really good at setting you up with resources once the crisis has passed. And again, we will talk a little bit more about these specifically and what's available here in our city a little bit later. So who should consider counseling? My biased answer is that everyone should consider going to see a counselor from time to time. Mm -hmm. Just like you would see your primary physician for a yearly physical, I think every few years someone should try to schedule an appointment with a counselor just to get their thoughts on, hey, here's what's going on in my life. Here's what I'm noticing with my emotions and my thoughts and my behaviors. Is there anything going on there that could be a cause for concern? And it doesn't have to be this long drawn out thing. I've worked with people who come into the office two or three times and decide that they're good. And then I don't see them again for a few more years till they decide to come back. And that is perfectly okay. However, there are individuals who I would definitely encourage more so to look into mental health counseling for themselves. The first being individuals who are having difficulty functioning in one or more areas of life. And typically as therapists, we break that down into um, either academic slash professional, um, social slash relational, or you know, just your general functioning. Like, are you able to get out of bed every day? Are you showering as often as you need to? Are you taking care of your hygiene? Are you eating enough? Are you eating too much? Just those day-to-day -day things that can become um, unkempt or not attended to in the way that they should. So if you're finding that you're struggling at work or you're finding that you're struggling in your interpersonal relationships, those would be two different areas of functioning that we tend to look at. Also individuals who have a family history of mental health disorders, we'll talk about that soon. And families who have a history of addiction, I highly recommend that those individuals get in to see counselors on a regular basis. Um, and those, those two are asterisk because, this is silly on my part, asterisk reminds me of the word ask, and that was kind of what I was leaning for for these two. Families especially are very good at sweeping issues under the rug. So like even in my adult life, I'm learning things about like family members that I'm like, maybe this would have been important for me to know you know, going into my adult life, you know, what struggles people had, because these things will repeat, and we'll talk about this later. But the asterisks are there because a lot of times I try to encourage people, if you don't know what your family mental health history is, or if you don't know if addiction has plagued one or multiple individuals in your family, ask, because chances are no one's going to volunteer that information. And one of the resources that we're going to talk about soon, I'll kind of go into a little bit more detail on what that looks like. Yeah, we'll jump right into talking about generational trauma or mental health trends that tend to fall, um, you know, get passed on from generation to generation to generation. Um, the first thing on the right, this is a book called It Didn't Start With You. And I think it's a really great resource for individuals who want to learn more about how this works. It's not overly clinical, so anyone can read it and kind of gain the information that they need from it. 
it's not a perfect book. I will warn you on that. Um, there are definitely times where as I was reading it, I'm like, I think the author is really reaching to make their point here. Um, maybe they're trying to get something out of this that maybe wasn't happening there. So a couple of things that were in there, you know, I just kind of flagged as a, I'm gonna take this with a grain of salt, but the rest of the information in there was really, really good. Um, generational trauma is something that is not just habit-based. Like this is something that biologically, physiologically happens. As we are reproducing, um, our, our bodies pass along DNA to the various, um, I don't know if there are children listening, so I'm trying to keep it G-rated. Um, but through the various processes of reproduction and what is involved with that, our bodies pass along DNA and DNA store memory. And memory contributes to instinct. This is a lot of times how animals are able to be born just knowing how to walk or knowing what a predator is or knowing, oh, here's what I consume. That has been passed down through their DNA and that's how they know. And humans function the same way. Our DNA teaches us from the time before we're even born how to survive in our world. So with that, it can teach us what is good for us, but it can also teach us what is bad for us. I'll give you an example. I worked with an individual, a child. Um, the parents came to me and they were like, well, you know, they've been diagnosed ADHD for like it had been like six or seven years at that point. They had tried numerous medications and different types of interventions and things like that, and nothing worked, which to me told me this is not ADHD. If nothing has worked, then we're probably not looking at the right diagnosis here. So when I was actually meeting with the child, I noticed that they were very fidgety, very, very talkative, very fast, and just moving a lot, but they're also very like on edge. Like they sat on the edge of the couch. They were constantly looking at the door. And if like the AC kicked on or something, they would just be like, what's that? They would have a startle response. This doesn't look like ADHD. So I brought the parents back in and I asked the father, I said, sir, do you, were you by chance like in the military? And he said, yeah, like I forget what war he served in, but he had served in a war and he had been, um, active duty. And he told me that he had a diagnosis of PTSD from that. And he would experience nightmares, flashbacks, just hypervigilance. Like, okay, what about your father? So now talking about the child's grandfather. And he said, same for him, PTSD from fighting in a couple of wars, um, you know, to the time that he died, apparently he had, had had issues managing this. So based on that information and just kind of what I observed from the child and the fact that none of the ADHD interventions had worked for him like at all, I was able to tell them, your child doesn't have ADHD. Your child is predispositioned to have an anxiety disorder because the grandfather's DNA and the father's DNA essentially taught him in the womb to be on high alert. And that's how generational trauma and generational Kind of mental health concerns work is that when we reproduce, we start telling the next generation what to be afraid of, what to be worried about. Um, for women, this is especially important because in the womb, you already have eggs. So you are already passing DNA to those eggs before you are even born. So I try to especially encourage women who are pregnant to really start taking care of their mental health and to, you know, if they're in like physically abusive situations or just in difficult life circumstances to really work hard to get out of those because everything is being fed to that unborn child and that unborn child's children as well. Um, are there any questions or thoughts on the, the generational trauma? <laughs> or anything that you are thinking about for your own families or things starting to click? Like, oh wait, this makes sense now that my family deals with this. Addiction works the same way. Um, you know, if, if there is a person who is addicted to a substance and they procreate, 
then it's very likely that their children and their grandchildren will be predisposed to easily form addictions as well. So I try to caution people, if your grandfather or your parents themselves had an addiction, you need to be on high alert. Great grandparents, you can be a little bit safer, but still I would try to be a little bit cautious. And if this is repeated for multiple generations, then you need to be extra on high alert for this because um, this is something that is easily passed down. And it's really weird because like the, even the wildest like little family trends will come through. Like one of the examples in the book was that um, an individual had been arrested, like their, their life of crime, I guess, kind of started with a simple car, simple carjacking, is that a thing? <laughs> it started with a carjacking. <laughs> And come to find out, he was not the first member of his family that had kind of fallen into a life of crime. And their first offense was a carjacking. So, you know, learning what our families deal with and asking those questions like, you know, hey, what, what was, what, what's going on with grandma? Like, why is she dealing with what she's dealing with? Or is there a history with Uncle Jerry or something like that, or even talking to your parents, asking those sensitive questions can be really important. And the book explains this better than I will, but one of the biggest um, kind of measures as to whether or not a, you know, something will get passed down to the next generation is whether or not the family talks about it and makes the issue known. Most families, like I said earlier, don't talk about these things because they're afraid that talking about it will cause it to happen when research has shown the opposite to be true. Families that sweep these things under the rug are more likely to pass them down and families that talk about them openly are more likely not to. So I try to encourage families to talk about the skeletons in the closet, talk about the hard stuff, have those difficult conversations, even with kids as they're, as, as they're growing up and beginning to learn more about these things start having these discussions. Um, that's one of the reasons that I really loved the movie Encanto, if anyone has watched that. Have either of you watched that? Mm -hmm. So good. Watching it as a therapist who comes from a dysfunctional family was a ride and a half, let me tell you. Um, the whole time I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna cry. And then by the end of it, I'm like, oh dear goodness, I can't even. Um, and Kanto does a really great job of introducing children to how this works. And I think the further, the more and more society kind of accepts this and understands this to be true, we'll have more resources to kind of help children navigate this. But I encourage people to start talking about this with their children, um, even the little ones, the earlier, the better. So this is just a fun little cartoon that I think emphasizes the point. Um, you got two parent hearts, Valentine's candies. And, you know, they're kind of pointing to each other saying like, well, you need to go to therapy. And then the other one's saying, you go first. And I see this so often with families. But then you have the little one who's in the stroller and they're just saying, I think I'm gonna be the first one to go because of what's happening behind them with the parents. And yes, we see that a lot. So parents, I encourage you to take that lead. Go get help for yourselves. It's gonna help, it's gonna help the future generations. I would, I would bet money on it. When to see a professional before you get into a conflict like the heart candies were. Um, but I usually encourage people to start seeing seeking out therapy when familial family patterns that they don't like or they wish they could break start to emerge because chances are it will happen. Um, going back again um, to the, I've been following the trial with like Johnny Depp and Amber Heard because I, I love legal stuff. And there's been like a lot of psychological and mental health things brought into that discussion. And, you know, Johnny Depp was abused horrendously by his mother growing up. And his father was very passive. You know, he didn't seem to try to stop the abuse and he himself was subjected to it as well. And lo and behold, Johnny's um, marriage to Amber Heard, as it has come out, is she was very abusive towards him. And essentially what happens is people will be attracted to what's normal, even if that normal is not 
good. So if they have like addiction that runs into family or mental health issues that runs in the family and they're looking for a partner, a mate to spend the rest of their life with, a lot of times they'll be attracted to someone who mimics those negative things that they actually want to get away from because again, normal is safe. Even if it's not good, normal is safe. So when undesired family patterns start to emerge, either in your behaviors or if you find that, wow, I swore that I would never, you know, raise my children the way my parents raised me, and yet my spouse and I are doing the exact same things that we swore we would never do, that's a red flag. And that is a good time to start seeking counseling to help process and break through some of those trends. When problems in marriage start to emerge, and I emphasize the word start, um, I did um, a practicum at my, um, during my master's degree and learned very quickly that couples counseling is not for me. I met with two couples. One of them literally decided to divorce in front of me. And I was like, that is, and they had been doing well. Like we had seen each other like eight or nine times. They were making progress. My supervisor was really happy with where they were going. And then the last time I saw them, they just decided to end it. And then they asked me to like pray them out of the session. And I'm just like, no, like I will be praying for you, but I don't think my heart can bless, you know, what has kind of happened here. And I learned that that is just not for me. But there are many individuals who do love to work with couples, and many of them will attest that when a couple decides to go to marriage counseling, a lot of times it's already too late. The problem has become too big, or they've become too resentful, and it's, been, it's gotten out of their control. And um, a lot of them, you know, I think research has shown that a lot of times when couples seek therapy, one or both partners has already begun to heavily consider divorce. And it's, it's really sad because, you know, talking to a lot of marriage therapists, this has been happening for a while, but like, especially these days, it's kind of like, they're almost rebranding themselves as like marriage and divorce therapists, because a lot of their role now is just helping these couples to navigate their divorce instead of end their marriage. And I don't mean to put blame on the couples, but when concerns start to emerge is the time to go. A lot of times they wait too long. Um, and when functioning is impacted, like when we, what we talked about earlier, are you normally on time to work? But for the last month or two, you've been showing up later and later and later because you have a hard time getting out of bed. Or are you snapping at people more than you used to? Are some of your relationships having trouble because you're just finding that People are repulsive and you don't want to be around them when normally you're this social butterfly. Or even are you normally a quiet, reserved person, but now you just feel this overwhelming compulsion to go out and socialize. So now you're draining your battery. And because of that, other areas of your life are being impacted. So I try to recommend when at least one area of functioning is beginning to show signs of deteriorating, that is the time, the time to go. Um, a lot of people believe, and some people do make it happen, but a lot of people believe that they can contain it to just one area of functioning, and that is rarely the case. You know, you can keep it contained for a while, but oftentimes it will start to spill over into other areas of functioning, and then it just starts to snowball from there. Um, but ultimately, what I recommend is to go seek therapy or some kind of help before a concern turns into a problem, because those are two very different things. And a concern is much more easier to address than a problem is. So as soon as you start to think, this isn't normal, or I don't like this, I'm very uncomfortable with this, I don't like what's happening, I feel like I'm starting to lose control of this, that's the time to go. Where can I go? This is kind of the resource heavy portion of the presentation tonight. Um, these are specifically resources for children because um, a lot of times 
I think their concerns can get easily swept under the rug or just considered to be, hey, this is ADHD and you know, it's fine, it's normal. A lot of times it's not. Um, MindPeaceCincinnati.com. This is a wonderful resource because what they do is they're kind of like a hub of all of the different mental health resources available in Cincinnati for children, including school-based therapists not school psychologists or school counselors, like we talked about earlier, that they're different, but actual school-based therapists, mental health clinicians like myself who diagnose and treat disorders in children. They have a list for all of the mental health partners who work within a Cincinnati public school, as well as schools in the greater Cincinnati area. So you can learn the name of the agency that partners with that school. They'll give you the um, main person's contact information. It's just wonderful. They have a lot of COVID-19 resources as well. They have virtual mind peace rooms, which if you have a child who's like having a rough time and just needs some stimulation, they can do this virtual room with lots of different videos and activities and books and things like that that they can, they can do online. And it's really, really great. Best Point Urgent Care. This is a new one that I love. And so far people that I've worked with have had an amazing experience with them to back up a little bit in case folks didn't know, the children's home in St. Aloysius, they used to be two individual mental health providers, but this year they merged and now they are called Best Point. Yes, so, and strangely enough, St. Joe's Orphanage also rebranded this year. They're now called New Path. So everyone's just rebranding and changing. Um, but Best Point is that merger between the children's home and St. Aloysius. They opened up an urgent care, a walk-in urgent care for behavioral health concerns. And the great thing about them is that they purposefully operate outside of school and working hours because that tends to be the time where people can't get help. So you can literally walk in and say, you know, my child has this concern. I would like for them to be seen by a clinician today and they'll make it happen. Um, sometimes they can also handle medication refills. Sometimes that can be a crisis for a family where they're like, hey, you know, our insurance lapsed or we can't get a hold of our doctor or we missed an appointment so we can't get this medication refilled and this child needs it, sometimes they can step in and make that happen rather quickly. Um, they're open Monday through Friday from 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. And again, you can just walk in. You do not have to set up an appointment, just go. And then this is one that not a lot of people know about um, Cincinnati Children's Hospital's um, Psychiatric Intake Response Center. They are the ones who handle like the intakes for children who come in for behavioral health emergencies. However, the phone number is on the screen because you can call them ahead of time and have a consultation to determine whether or not the child needs to be seen in the emergency room. We use this a lot um, at the school that I work in. If we have a child who's in crisis, I'll call PERC and I'll say, hey, here's what's going on with the kid. How, here's how they're presenting. Here are the concerns that we have. And children will literally tell us, well, you know, if they came here, we would probably send them to Best Point. You know, this sounds like something they would be able to handle. Or they'll say, yes, bring them in. They need to be seen. And they'll start the intake process over the phone. So they'll collect the child's like date of birth, their name, their address, so that the wait time at the actual hospital is shortened and they can be seen much faster. So this is not just available to um, clinicians or doctors. Parents can call this number 24 hours a day. Um, they're wonderful, they're compassionate, um, they're always willing to help. So I, I give that line to anyone who has a child. Um, very, very awesome resource. So for some of the things that we talked about earlier, um, peer counseling, I'm sure that there are plenty of other um, churches and organizations who offer this to an extent, um, but one is called the Eve Center. Now they work exclusively with women. I think that they have tried a couple of times to open the Adam Center for men. Um, I don't think they've been successful yet, but we're praying that someday they will be. Um, but they not only train women to become peer counselors, they offer the peer counseling in-house. And here's the awesome part, it's no cost, absolutely no cost. Um, they offer groups, um, they do reading groups where they'll go through like a book together and they'll do the one-on-one -on -one counseling too. 
And what I love about them is that they are very, I did a small internship with them um, the summer before I went to grad school. And their intake process is really great because what they do is they try to pair the woman who needs help with a peer counselor who has been in her position. So if they, you know, have a woman who calls and says, well, you know, I, I terminated my pregnancy and now I'm having regrets, they will pair her with a peer counselor who has also been through that. Or have, if there has been assault or abuse in the past, they're going to pair her with a peer counselor who has been through that their phrase or their motto is we've been where you are and they they walk that out through through how they you know pair people with their peer counselors for clinical counseling there are a few things that you can do where is the eve center the eve center i think they relocated they used to be in silverton and they're they're their smaller hub might still be there, but I think as I've kind of followed them on social media, I always see that they're like somewhere else now. So I think they have a second location. Okay. Um, but if you visit the Eve Center, I think .com, you can, you can find information there. Great. For clinical counseling, asking your doctor is always a good start. Um, they will usually have a list of therapists that they are kind of in cahoots with that they can say, hey, they might be a good fit for you, try them. Asking your insurance carrier, they have a list of providers who are in network with them and can provide those services at, you know, through your insurance, which can be really helpful. Here's one that a lot of working people don't actually know. Um, if you receive health insurance or any other kind of benefits through your employer, chances are you also get what's called EAP benefits but you usually have to ask for them very specifically. And sometimes it requires a heck of a lot of digging. Um, for my husband's employer, we were trying to find him a counselor just for a you know, couple of check-in sessions. Like, well, let's, let's see if they have an EAP, um, if you have EAP benefits. And it took several higher ups for us to finally figure out how to get that ball rolling. Um, but asking your employer if you qualify for EAP benefits. If you do, what that typically looks like is through those benefits, you can get anywhere from three to eight no cost sessions through your employer with a therapist or an attorney as well. I just learned that a lot of them can be used to meet with an attorney for some reason. So there you go. So if you are employed and if you receive benefits, ask specifically for EAP and that can be a no cost option. And those EAP benefits reset every year. So if you got eight sessions in 2021, chances are you'll qualify for eight more sessions in 2022. So great little money saving resource. Phone a friend, asking friends, you know, hey, I'm looking for a therapist for myself or for so-and-so, who have you seen? Is there anyone that you work with? Or do you know anyone who's in the field who you might be able to refer me to? I love this one because I think it really helps to eliminate the stigma around counseling because, you know, everyone asks for referrals to doctors and dentists and, you know, physical therapists or things like that. But, well, I hear it often. People ask me for a referral to therapists, but I don't hear that conversation asked you know, happening as frequently as like doctors or dentists. So the more that we're willing to ask our friends and family, like, hey, do you have a clinician that you know, and you'd like who you could possibly, you know, connect me with helps to make that helps to normalize that conversation and helps to reduce the stigma. And then lastly, psychologytoday.com. Um, this one can be a little overwhelming, but I still like to put it on there. Um, you can search for therapists by zip code. You can search for them by specialty. You can search for them by, you know, lots of different criteria. Do, if they accept your insurance or if they're private pay only. Um, and a lot of times they'll like, it will tell you on the website if the individual is accepting new clients or not. That way you don't have to go through that thing where, you know, you call and they're like, oh, I, you know, I could see you in six months. And then you're like, oh, okay, great. Click. <laughs> Um, they'll, a lot of times psychology today will have that information available to you. Um, one side note, especially in this day and age, there are a lot of wait lists. So if, if mental health therapy is something that you or a loved one are looking into, 
now would be a good time to get the ball rolling because it could be a little bit um, before you can get in with someone just because the demand is so high. Um, just a little note there. For crisis support, this one's really can I ask new. You a question. Oh, absolutely. Back on that. Yeah. Um, I know, like for my children who are out of um, state for college, mm -hmm. um, there can be, you know, like with whatever specialists, for yeah. headaches or those kinds of things. It's tricky going across state lines for those virtual appointments. Yes. How does it work? Is it the same with counseling? Excellent question. So, in case you didn't hear her, the question was, how does like out out of state counseling work. You know, you have folks who have to move around a lot for their job. You have folks who are in college out of state. Um, unfortunately, I'll put it this way. I am licensed in the state of Ohio. That means I can only practice in the state of Ohio. And that depends on where the client is, not where I am. So if the client that I'm seeing is physically in the state of Kentucky, I can't see them because I'm not licensed in that, in that state. If I went to Florida and still wanted to see my clients here in Ohio, I could do that. Um, so you can look for therapists who are dual licensed in multiple states. Um, but if you do have like a child who's in college, I would suggest trying to find a therapist who is in their state. We're hoping that in the next five, 10 years or so, license transfer will be a much easier thing. Through COVID, um, I know the state of Kentucky, they did this really simple thing where they're like, hey, give us your information and we will if, issue you a provisional license so you can see clients in Kentucky. And it was great. And they ended it. <laughs> it made me super upset because now my clients who are in Kentucky have to drive all the way to Ohio to see me. Um, but we're hoping that in the next few years that will um, become much easier because that can be a really big barrier. I have a couple of young ones who are, you know, going to be going to college soon and they've started to ask the question, you know, I'm out of state for college. Can I still see you? And I'm like, no, but we can have sessions when you come back yeah. <laughs> um, for like breaks and things like that. Yeah. So yeah. good question. Yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah. Um, crisis support. Very near and dear to my heart. Um, the whole reason I became a therapist is because a family member of mine was in crisis and did not get the help that they needed. So 24 hours a day, Talbert House has a crisis line that can be reached anytime, any day by anyone. Um, it's 513-281-CARE, which translates as 2273 on the phone. And what they can do is if you have a loved one who is in danger of harming themselves or others, and you don't necessarily know to go, you know, should I go to the police? Should I try to take them to the ER? Like, what should I do? They can help guide you through that and navigate that with you. They can also talk to the person and provide support. They can also reach out to emergency services on your behalf if you're tied up, you know, doing other things. So they're really great. And in addition, um, the department for Talbert House that I work for, school-based services, we also act as the agency's crisis response team. So while we might not be the ones answering the phone, there might be a crisis situation where a group of individuals needs support for a couple of days, like groups to process what has happened. We get dispatched through that line. So if you know of a situation like for example, we responded to the shooting on Fountain Square a few years ago. Um, the employees at Grader's Ice Cream right next door saw the whole thing. Um, my supervisor and I, we actually went to the store before we met with the group to kind of get an idea of, okay, what did they see? Like, what does their store look like? What, what is the bathroom that they were barricaded in for an hour? Like, what does that look like? And we walked into the store and there's this big glass wall behind the counter where they serve the ice cream and donuts and such. And it looks, it looked right into the fifth third bank where the shooting happened. And when I saw, you know, the window, I also saw like the surveillance footage that I saw on the news and I could pinpoint exactly where the shooter and his victims were. And I was like, oh my gosh, they saw everything. <laughs> And so we were able to meet with them for a few days and kind of help them process through that and get them some resources for ongoing care. So if you ever know of a 
family or a group that is in crisis or has experienced something that is life altering or someone they know has passed away. Like we'll, we'll go to a lot of schools for student or parent or teacher deaths, um, call that line. And that's, that's how we get dispatched. Um, the Cincinnati Police Department, I know it can be kind of a sensitive subject these days on whether or not to send the police to mental health crises. Um, a lot of their recruits now go through this specific program, but they still have a designated team. If you do ever feel like you need to call 911 for an individual who is unsafe for a behavioral health reason, specifically ask for the mental health response team. They will purposefully send an officer who has been specially trained to handle these situations, and they will know to collect information ahead of time to prevent a situation from escalating. So for example, they'll ask, does the individual have any known diagnoses? Are they taking medication? Do they have access to weapons right now? So that the officer knows exactly what they're walking into. And a lot of times the police department will pair up with our, it's through UC Medical, they call it mobile crisis, so it's not really mobile. Um, they don't really go out to these situations a lot anymore like they used to, but they still coordinate a lot with the police to kind of help them triage these situations. And then if you don't know where else to go, UC Hospital, um, they are like the primary psychiatric emergency room in our city. Um, so UC Medical is a good place for that. And then finally, why? And this was the question that I kind of wanted to open up to the participants tonight. Um, why is this important to you? Or is there anything that you learned tonight that maybe stuck out to you that maybe you hadn't thought about or discussed before? So if you're on Zoom, you are free to unmute and answer that question if you would like, or if you're here in the space today, how would you answer the question, why should you, or why should your family think about pursuing mental health care, mental health treatment, even if it's from time to time? 